This presentation is about collections in C++. Uh, from time to time, it's necessary to put together a data structure that can uh, contain a collection of things. So these are called uh, collections or containers. Um, all of the different collections or containers that are available in C++ um, are, are uh, included in something called the standard template library. Uh, and this is going to review just some of the things that are in that library. So C++ provides these templated types for collections. Uh, those of you who are uh, Java programmers are familiar with this idea of templates. It's angle bracket enclosed type names is how you indicate that something is a template. Um, and all of these different collection methods come with methods to uh, perform operations on the collection. And the type of what's in the collection is part of the declaration. So you can have a, a collection of integers, a collection of strings, or a collection of more complicated types. Uh, the important thing to know is that uh, the type is a compile time parameter. It has to be known at compile time, uh, not at runtime. And knowing the type that's in the collection means that the compiler uh, knows what belongs there and won't put anything into the collection that doesn't belong there. So we say that the collections are strongly typed and are type safe for what they contain. Uh, a collection of integers, the compiler knows that it's integers and it knows you can only do integery things with it, for example. First collection to talk about is a vector. And a vector uh, is something that's part of the standard template library. It's available if you pound include the vector header. Uh, you can think of a vector as a kind of an array, an array of adjustable size. And uh, those of you who are Java programmers who are familiar with array lists, a vector is an awful lot like an array list in, uh, in Java. Uh, a vector is an adjustable sized array and it behaves like an array. Like an array, there's constant time access to entries in the vector, and that's great. Um, but the vector is going to be something that, that will dynamically change its size as needed. So uh, there's some notion of the vector having a capacity and some part of that capacity is used. So if the vector has a capacity for eight objects and there are six objects in it, adding an object to the end of the vector involves changing the contents from six items to seven items, the capacity is still eight. But if you add stuff to a vector that's already full to capacity, uh, the vector implementation will automatically resize itself, which involves uh, spending time to allocate some memory and to copy information around. Uh, removing an item from the end of the vector, from the far end of the vector, is a constant time operation because you just say, well, now the size is uh, 6 instead of 7, but you keep the capacity alone. Now, you can insert an item into the middle of the vector, uh, just like you can insert an item into the middle of the array, but that's going to cost you. Uh, adding something into the middle of vector, uh, if the vector's already full, trying to add something to the middle of the vector actually is going to require um, uh, an operation to allocate more memory, and it's going to require an operation to copy the contents around. Even if you've got room for an extra element in the middle, you still have to copy everything to the right of where you're doing the insert over. So inserting into the middle is not a constant time operation. It's at least an order n operation, plus whatever the cost might be of reallocating memory. Um, removing an item from the middle of the vector, uh, you know, it's an array. So if you're going to remove an item from the middle of the vector, you, you create a gap, which you've got to close. So you've got to copy things to the right of what you removed into that gap. So that's potentially an order n operation. So uh, everything that you learned about arrays and the things that you can do with arrays in terms of computational complexity, uh, they're true for vectors as well. Uh, you give the type <laughs> of what's in the vector uh, when you declare it. So um, vector less than int greater than. Uh, the type name int inside of the angle brackets, means it's a vector of ints. And a vector comes with methods to modify members of the vector, determine the size, you know, all that jazz. You can tell how big a vector is. You can tell what its capacity is. You can change its capacity. You can resize it. You can clear it. Okay. Uh, 
it's like an array, so it has array semantics, and the way that they handle array semantics is to overload the square bracket operator. So operator square bracket is overloaded to provide access to members of the vector, but it can only access members that are already in the vector. If you try and use operator square bracket uh, for to access something that's not in the vector, if you got a vector of five things and you try and access vector sub 10, uh, operator square bracket will fail. Um, if you want to add something to the end of a vector, there's a, there's a pushback method. So here's some examples of, of how this goes, right? Um, here I'm declaring a vector of integers, and the name of it is my vec. Now that declaration makes an empty vector. And if I try and say my vec sub 0 equals 10, uh, that's going to fail because there is no sub zero entry in my vec. My vec is empty. If, however, I say my vec dot push back 10, I'm taking that empty vector and I'm pushing a 10 into it. Right. So um, the, the vector has a certain capacity to it. We, we don't necessarily know what that is, and and for our purposes it doesn't matter. Right. Uh, we're changing uh, the vector from having nothing in it to having one item in it. So as soon as we do that pushback, uh, the, the size of the vector is now 1, which means my vec sub 0 is now OK. And since my vec sub 0 is OK, um, we can use it on the left-hand side of the equal sign, uh, saying my vec sub 0 equals 100 goes in and changes that entry in the vector. So you can see it looks just like array operations once you've set it up properly. Now the useful thing for vectors is that you want to, once you've got a, a, a vector full of integers or a container full of integers, uh, maybe you want to look through the whole vector. One way to do that is to treat the vector like an array. right? So it has array semantics, so it should work. So here I've declared a vector of integers. Um, and you know, let's assume we've filled it up with stuff. This for loop says, start with 0, go until my vec dot size. So as you can see, you probably guessed that there's a dot size member um, in the vector that tells how big it is. So i sub 0 is the first entry, i sub 1 is the second entry, they're consecutive entries, it goes up to size, that's all great, and this will print out the, uh, the value of i and whatever is at that position in the vector with a, a colon in between. There's other ways to look at uh, the whole vector too. <clears throat> These containers uh, come with something called iterators, okay? Um, and this is, uh, might take a little getting used to, but it, it's pretty straightforward, okay? Uh, you see here the first line of code declares a vector of integers named myVec. Uh, because I've got a vector, one of the things I might want to do is iterate through the vector. In order to iterate through the vector, I need an iterator. Specifically, I need an iterator that knows how to iterate through a vector of integers. <clears throat> so I say vector of int colon colon iterator. Remember we said standard colon colon means look in the namespace standard for something. Here we're saying vector of int colon colon iterator. Look in the vector of int namespace for an iterator that knows how to iterate over vector of int. So it is a variable of type iterator over vector of int. Okay. Now the vector has a couple of members, uh, uh, methods rather, I'm sorry, um, begin and end. So if we want to iterate through the whole vector, we initialize the iterator to begin, myvec.begin, and we keep going until the iterator is not equal to myvec.end. Uh, you'll notice that the increment in the for loop here, it++, uh, we've overloaded, or not we, the, the people who implemented the vector iterator, overloaded plus plus. So if I add one to an iterator, it causes me to go to the next thing in the vector, or have the iterator point to the next thing in the vector. And you notice here that now what I do is I print out star it. I take the iterator. Star it means take what the iterator points to and... Uh, and show what uh, is at that position in the vector. So this will do the same thing as the previous page. It will uh, go through every entry in the vector. It just accesses the entries themselves uh, 
uh, in a slightly different way. And uh, this wouldn't be complete if there wasn't yet another way to do it. The way to look at the whole vector is to use range-based for loops. Uh, this is a relatively recent uh, thing in um, C++, uh, and something like this is in Java as well. Um, similar to the previous examples, we have a vector of integers named myvec, and we just say for int i colon myvec. So you could read that as for every integer i in myvec, print out this list, and it'll print out every entry in the vector. So if the vector contains 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, this program will print out 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. You can also say for int ampersand. Uh, the ampersand means reference, and, and we're going to talk more about pointers and references, which we mentioned briefly in the last slide. Um, we're going to talk about pointers and references and all that in, in a future lecture, but suffice it to say that it's multiple different ways of looking at the entries in the vector. So these two things do the same thing. In the first case, it looks at the integer. In the second case, it looks at every integer, a reference to every integer in the vector. Uh, but the end result is the same thing. If the vector contains 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, it prints out 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So that's cool. We got vectors. There's other kinds of collections as well. Let me just give you a couple of, of quick, uh, a look at a couple of them. Uh, one is, or one other one is, the list. So we remember what a list is from data structures, okay? Uh, and if we want to use a list, uh, we pound include list. And this is also as part of the standard template library. So like vectors, it's in the namespace standard. So the list has to indicate what its type is. So it's a list of integers, a list of strings, a list of some other more complicated things, uh, a list of lists. If that's something you want to do, that works. Now, lists do not have array semantics. It doesn't make sense to say the ith entry in the list. I mean, it might make sense to say the ith entry in the list, but it's not a, looking at the ith entry in the list is not a constant time operation. And so the implementers of list decided not to overload the square bracket. Okay, so you can't say list sub i to find the ith entry in the list we know from data structures that to find the ith entry in the list, you have to start at the beginning and search through. Uh, the difference here between uh, lists and vectors is because it's a list, it has list behavior. That means that unlike an array where you have to move things around, uh, inserting an element anywhere in the list or deleting an element anywhere in the list is a constant time operation. Okay, and there's... there's uh, uh, methods to add things to the list and take things out of the list. Now here there are also iterators available to sequence through the list, which is great. Um, because there is no operator square bracket, that first method of iterating through the vector collection doesn't work. The only way that you can iterate through a list is to use an iterator or use one of those uh, range-based for loops. Now, the other thing you can do is, if you want to find an entry in the list, you can use a find method, right? You can say, oh, find this entry in, in the list, and the result of calling find is some iterator, right? Uh, if the iterator is equal to end, the find failed, and the find has computational complexity that we know from lists. We have to, in the worst case, look at every entry in the list, so it's, it's about an order n operation. Right? Um, if the find succeeds, it returns an iterator, and if you uh, apply the star operator to the iterator, you can get the value. But, you know, if you know what you're searching for and the find succeeds, you know what the value is going to be. But you might use that iterator to then insert something before it or after it, and again, that's a, that's a constant time operation. Other data structures that are available uh, include queues. There is a queue. Um, and if you remember your data structures from queues, uh, um, if you remember queues from data structures, uh, a queue in C++ is just like that. Um, it's available via pound include queue. And it implements a FIFO queue, first in, first out, right? So you, you uh, put things into it, and the first thing that you put in is the first thing you get out. 
you, you push things into one end and you pop things at the other uh, for uh, various data structure reasons. Uh, there is no iterator to look through queues. You simply push something into the queue and pop something out of the front of the queue. You can think of a, a FIFO queue as a line, right? The first in online is the first one who is served. So you, you, you sort of add jobs to a queue by pushing them onto the end of the queue, and you do work that's in the queue by popping something off the queue and taking care of it. Okay, so that's the story on uh, vectors, lists, and queues. Uh, if you find yourself in a circumstance where you need those data structures, uh, C++ provides them. They're all part of the standard template library, and you get at them with pound include. And if you say using namespace standard, you can just use vector, list, or queue.